Hello everybody and welcome back to Rob's Arcade. Now, I've already talked to you guys every day this week, but I figured, well one, it's Thursday, throwback Thursday, and I'm not doing anything, so maybe I should sit back and do something a little bit fun for throwback Thursday with you guys. Where I could kind of just hang out and maybe share some comic books from my collection from the past. Now, yesterday I went to uh, the, the comic, the comics book club, and they were out of current side bags and boards. All they had was this uh, the Silver Age here, which works works perfectly fine. Um, in fact. I believe this is the, the same size I used to use. Oh, look, at that's what I need right there. It's kind of dark in here. I need that light. You can see my beautiful face. Um, I think it's the same size I used when I first started collecting. I'm not really sure. Um, and then I switched over to uh, current size um, pretty quickly. Uh, but they were all out of current. And as I mentioned in yesterday's video, uh, I feel like Silver Age bags and boards are better than well, no bags and boards at all. And when I got to thinking, a lot of times, um, because bags and boards, they're not that expensive, but you know, they, they can get costly when it comes to just like switching out, I guess, old bags and boards. But I've got a ton of older comics of mine from like the 90s and stuff that probably need new bags and boards. They probably just don't look as great. They're kind of like, you know, dingy and kind of dark. Like, you know, you get a, a brand new bag and it kind of adds a little bit of gloss and shine to that to that cover. And after time, you know, the plastic can kind of deteriorate and, well, not really deteriorate, it doesn't like fall apart really, but it does lose that. It gets kind of cloudy, it gets kind of milky looking. And so what I figured I would do is just kind of go through my collection, flip through some comic books and find some uh, that could use new bags and like a new fresh bag and board. And like some of them aren't too bad. I'm not gonna go through and switch out like every single bag and board. Uh, but I figured this would be a kind of a cool thing to do, kind of hang out with you guys and share some comic books from my past for Throwback Thursday here in Rob's Arcade. So let's uh, sit back, hang out with me as I take you on a blast through the past as we flip through my comic book collection. Oh, this is a cool one. I don't remember this one. All right, cool. Already we have a pretty good example of what I'm talking about right here with this Avengers number 402 from September 1996. That was a cool year, right? 1996. What were you doing? I was like 16 in 1996. What were you guys doing? Were you even born yet? I don't know. Uh, this is a fun issue, actually. I really like this issue a lot. Uh, we got the Avengers. They're, they're dealing with the onslaught. Um, arc here in this which if you're not very familiar with it go ahead and just hop on hop on wikipedia and look up the onslaught um because i think it's like a, it was like a multi crossover with the x-men if i'm not mistaken as well uh but this is just a great issue it starts off with the avengers the earth's mightiest heroes joining forces to get a subway car moving it's really good stuff i think thor actually uses his hammer as like a flashlight and as a power source to power up the subway while the wasp and wanda use their powers to scout out ahead and make sure the tracks are clear but uh the the board is a little dingy compared to some of the others it's vis visibly not as white um and then um, it's just not as clear as we can see here. This is, this has been recently, uh, bagged and, and boarded and you can just kind of see that this right here, this is a newer bag, older comic, newer bag and board. This guy hasn't been in a new home in a long 
time. So let's get this guy into a new room. This was a really funny one here. Oh, and actually this one right here, probably this would be a great, uh, a great one to rebag and board as well. Another Avengers, but this is the West Coast Avengers. We've got uh, Vision there on the front, Wonder Man, Hawkeye. Is that Chitara from Wonder Woman? That's odd. And then of course, Scarlet Witch in her infamously famous costume that was mocked at in their show. And uh, this is a really cool um, issue because it deals exactly with Wanda and uh, the Vision and their relationship and how he's kind of disappeared. And not only disappeared, but it's almost like he's been erased from existence. And that was a really cool issue. I love a lot of the, uh, the earlier Avenger stuff dealing with Wanda and the Vision very like much like a soap opera which is I think a very cool um like tone for comic books that you really didn't get a whole lot of you know comics were very like you know kind of action sci-fi driven um there was always like a little bit of romance in there but I felt like those issues were very like soap opera soap opery and um kind of let themselves to like different storytelling which, I mean, it just makes all the more sense when you look at the show WandaVision and you have like a series that's kind of built on sitcoms and uh, the series itself was kind of like formatted very sitcom. Like it would have been really cool to have a second season of WandaVision where they could kind of do some of the same things, but maybe instead of mirroring like the sitcom aspect, they could kind of mirror like that uh, the uh, the soap opera kind of formula and style of storytelling. I don't know. That would have been pretty neat if you ask me. Yeah, if you ask me about it. Wow. Okay. So we're not getting very far out of the A's. Um, we're just kind of starting with the Marvel A through H's here. We're not getting very far. Uh, this one isn't that bad, but it definitely needs a new home. I feel like kind of dingy. And I just wanted to share this cover. Uh, very fun. This is actually the, um, it's not just the Avengers, this is the Terminatrix Objective, Avengers four-part miniseries. This is the second issue in the miniseries. I just only have the first two. I need to see how this thing ends. But very cool here. And as we're like coming up, speaking of like different series in the Marvel Universe, we're kind of coming up on some of this ideas of like uh, variants and like different variations of the same characters. And we kind of got that in, believe it or not, the Falcon and Winter Soldier. I mean, like, let's face it, US agent was basically kind of like a variant, if you will, of the Captain America character. Uh, here on this front issue, um, we've got War Machine and um, Iron Man. Then we've also got uh, Thor, but also Thunderstrike, and then Captain America, as well as the US agent. So very cool, it's got like each character, as well as like, their, uh, their counterpart there on the cover. Just really, really always like that. So there we go. All right, guys. C is for Cable. This is probably the original bag and bore that I've had since I had this comic book. Uh, great, great comic. We got, you know, cover here by uh, John Romita Jr. And DG. Part one of the two little mini series. Uh, this is one of those covers uh, growing up um, where the, the, the Punisher was kind of similar to these and it was just like in your face, gun blasted, blah, blah, blah. Kind of remind me a lot of like the action 90s movies that you probably weren't supposed to see as a teenager, but you like snuck around and watched them anyway. So uh, yeah, I've always loved Cable, that character, X-Force and all of that. Uh, this is the, the very first issue here of, uh, of Cable. But yeah, this guy definitely, definitely needs a new uh, a new bag and a, and a new board. At last, X-Force, mysterious leader in his own limited series, Blood and Metal. And everything was just so, <laughs> everything was just so intense in the 90s. Blood and Metal. Love it. Absolutely love it. All right, now, believe it or not, there are a lot of characters in the Marvel and the DC universe that you would think like, oh, well, Robert probably got like a ton of those comics for that character, or he probably knows a lot about that character. And believe it or not, a lot of the characters in the Marvel universe that you would think I would know a ton about, 
I'm still learning and getting to know this stuff like on a weekly basis. Um, you know, as this books and as series and as movies and as things come out, I'm constantly going in and not only reading new material and seeing new things, but then going, okay, well, if they put this in the show, is this something that existed in the comic books? And so I'm constantly looking up things on Wikipedia and going online and just fact checking things and constantly realizing that I don't know a lot um, or as much about comics as, you know, I, you know, people like to think that I do. I'm very aware of this. This is something you guys need to be very aware of as well. And one of those characters that I just didn't read a lot of growing up and I didn't know a whole lot about as a kid was probably one of the biggest characters, if not the biggest character in the Marvel Universe. And I only say that because he was one of the very first characters that uh, helped propel that company. You know, you had, um, before I think it was even called Marvel Comics, it was called Timely Comics. And then they came along with characters like Captain America, the Human Torch, and then later the Fantastic Four, Spider-Man, X-Men. But all of these characters and all these things kind of started through this one character, Captain America. Now, here again, we've got our homeboy Cable here on the cover. And uh, Wolverine here in the background. And Captain America as a, that's right people, a werewolf. Cap Wolf. Now this was a very fun story. Um, the last part in this arc, and I've actually gone back and um, picked up some of the other issues. I got the follow-up issue to this story, kind of showing how everything gets wrapped up after this insane, insane story. Uh, but just a lot of fun. One of those books when I was growing up, it was like, you know, flipping through the comic rack. I had like a little spinner comic rack at the grocery store. And this is one of those things as I'm like flipping through, I'm like, I'm not a Captain America reader, but how am I going to pass up on Cap Wolf? Really cool. Plus I was like, you know, well, still am, but I was really big into horror movies. So this was like a really cool, like I'm getting a little bit of horror movie, Tales from the Crypt, you know, sci-fi weird uh, werewolf story, as well as my Captain America comic book stuff. And, you know, Wolverine back there in the background, you know, I was a sucker for Wolverine, Wolverine back in the day. Who will be Lord of the Wolves? Back off, fur face. So cool. So very, very cool. But you need a new sleeping bag as well, buddy. All right, well, before we jump out of the seas, let's take one last stop uh, with Captain America. This uh, is from 1997. Definitely did not acquire this book in 97. This was probably um, picked up in like a bulk collection or was given to me in a bulk collection. A lot of people will sometimes just give me their old comics or they will uh, go out and buy collections for me. This is probably uh, the result of one of those. Like I said, Captain America was never really one that I would like run out and grab issues of. Uh, nothing against the character. Uh, I think uh, just growing up, I was you know gravitating more towards um, characters that weren't necessarily like affiliated with like the government or um about like that like truth justice in the american way and kind of like that cheese like i really wasn't into superman i really wasn't into captain america they were kind of like i guess the uh the boy scout characters if you will i mean that's kind of how tony stark views uh captain america in the movies and i mean i think that's how probably the world would agree with me um I wanted to point this cover out because uh, it's done by Rob Liefeld, which is an artist who I absolutely, I, I, again, <clears throat> can't really stand. Um, his style was never one of my favorites growing up. It's just kind of weird, like um, very pointy noses and, you know, just, I don't know, very like angular and sharp cheekbones and stuff like that. Never one of my favorite artists. Uh, although he did come up with their, uh, their Deadpool. Deadpool was one of his creations, so we got to give him credit for that. Um, but they even poke fun of him in the movies, not being able to uh, to draw feet. But he's also just pulled out of cons before. I've been trying to meet this guy and get his autograph, and he's just, I don't know, he's been a, kind of a douche, um, in my opinion, in the comic book universe. Um, some of the stuff he's done with, like, Tom McFarlane, Image Comics. Um, I don't know, he's just kind of a, kind of a pretty boy jerk butt, if you ask me. Uh, but it's written by um, Jeff Loeb. We also got his name here on the on the front. And if you don't know who Jeff Loeb is, 
Um, he's He's been in a comic book. He's a great writer. Um, he's done a ton of work. I think he actually had a hand in the screenplay with um, the original Karate Kid film, which is actually a DC title. Not necessarily a DC comic book movie, but that title, Karate Kid, was borrowed from DC Comics. I think he worked on that movie, or was it... No, I take that back. It was Teen Wolf. I'm sorry. It was, I'm thinking of another... I'm getting like stuff all over the place. Teen Wolf was the movie I think Jeff Loeb helped write the screenplay for, um, but he was also a huge, huge consultant on the series Smallville, just because he knows so much about the character Superman, and he's just like, you know, um, he's been involved with comic books and the writing of comic books and their stories for a, a really, really, really long time. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to kind of talk about those two guys really quick. One of my favorites, Jeff Loeb, and one of my not so favorites, Rob Liefeld, right there on the cover of Captain America. But you still need a, a new home there as well, my friend. All right, guys, let's go ahead and jump into the Ds with my main man, Daredevil here. Now, this is a pretty old comic book. I picked this up on um, probably in the early 2000s. Um, it's from 1985, and it's uh, probably one of my older, uh, better condition comic books. Uh, now, I really like this one. I wanted to share this one with you guys because this, you know, one, not only is it older, um, but it's uh, done by one of my favorite um, comic book writers and artists, Frank Miller. Uh, I think Frank Miller provides most of the story um, and the plot uh, for this Daredevil series. Um, with the art of inside uh, the inside art there, Steve uh, Buscema, which is just amazing. Steve Buscema did a great, great job um, in the 80s and 90s on some of my favorite Spider-Man stuff. Um, but the, um, the cover here is actually done by Frank Miller as well. Um, early days, I think Frank was more um, noted and uh, credited for his writing in the comic books, giving it a grittier, darker edge. Uh, but later, um, he came in showing that not only could he really write a solid, you know, story for Batman or a solid story for Spider-Man or Daredevil, but he could also pencil it as well and give it kind of a, a new style and a new edge um, that comics um, hadn't seen in quite some time and wouldn't see for quite some time. Again, Frank Miller really came in and added some, uh, some really, really amazing stuff to... Uh, to the Marvel and, and DC comics. Um, you probably will be most familiar with his work in the cinematic universe with uh, The Spirit and of course, um, Sin City, those two films right there, inspired by uh, Frank, Frank Miller's work, but just a really cool comic, one of my faves. All right, well, we can't jump out of the D's without talking about Deadpool. And I was talking about him a little while um, a little while ago. Sitting there talking about Rob Liefeld. He helped um, create this, this character. Uh, this is Deadpool number one. This was like in that era where like 90s, everybody was getting their own book. You know, it was like, you know, Spider-Man had always had his own book. Wolverine had had his own series for a while. But for the most part, you know, like, you had, like, X-Force. You had your X-Men, you know. Um, but then it just seemed like the, the floodgates opened up. And it was like, oh, well, X-Force is out. Let's give, you know, Cable his own book. Let's give, you know, Daredevil his own book. Hey, Colossus. Let's give Colossus his own book. He deserves his own title. Um... <clears throat> And then there was also just like this influx of like new characters like uh, the Sleepwalker and uh, and uh, um, 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 Death's Head, Deathlock. And so it was just like, there was like number ones hitting, hitting the newsstands, I feel like every single week. And, and uh, why not get in on the fun? But this was a really cool title. And Deadpool was one of those books where, um, you know, my wife and I went to go see the film and she was like, was this what the comic book was like? Was the comic book this kind of like, she didn't expect like an R-rated, um, almost X-rated film, you know, based off of a Marvel property. And I explained to her, you know, Deadpool definitely was not like that in the comic book, but you have to look at it, what it was um, in, in representing what comic books were at that time. And for where Deadpool was in its time, 
it was definitely pushing the envelope. I think like with the, um, the sexual undertones, um, the overall violence, and then some of the language, they pushed the envelope just a little bit further in Deadpool. Maybe not, of course, quite as much as they pushed the envelope in the film, but I think that's quite like a great representation in the film of like how they were constantly pushing the envelope in the film, making people go, oh, wow, what are they gonna do? If they're gonna do this in the first 10 minutes of the movie, what are they gonna do in the first hour of the film? And Deadpool was very much like that in the comic book as well. Like, oh my gosh, if they're gonna do this on the first few pages of issue one, I mean, what are they gonna do by the time we get to like issue five? Uh, and so that's kind of like, you know, where um, Deadpool kind of fell into the comic book universe. And, and at that time, um, you know, in X-Men comics, you might have gotten like an idea of that like, okay, well, Jean Grey and Scott Summers are hooking up in the X-Mansion, little silhouette maybe through the curtains. I always say this uh, to people when explaining this to Deadpool, when you get to Deadpool, there's not gonna be like a little bit of an end window. You're gonna get like pretty much like, okay, there's gonna be some action going on tonight between Domino and Wade Wilson. And they make it very, very clear. I mean, they're not gonna show you exactly what's happening panel by panel, but your mind doesn't have to go as far to reach for that scenario that you might have to do so when reading um, X-Men issues from that same some, from that same era. I mean, I'm sure today um, comics push the envelope way beyond what Deadpool was doing in the 90s. But at that time, in like 1992, 1993, Deadpool was definitely guilty of kind of like, all right, let's just see how much we can get away with before the editors at Marvel are going to go, hey, no, we can't, we can't, we can't do this. Which is probably ultimately why uh, creators like Rob and Todd McFarlane and Jim Lee and a lot of uh, creators from Marvel and DC decided to leave and create their own company, Image Comics, because it gave them pretty much free reign to do uh, free reign to do whatever they wanted to do, basically. All right, guys, we're going to jump all the way to the F's with some Fantastic Four, 1984 here. Um, now this wasn't something I picked up in 1984 and actually for 1984 this isn't in really bad condition either. This is in similar condition to uh, that Daredevil I just showed you guys. Um, but this was something I picked up probably again in my 20s just going back and finding old issues of comic books and just old stories that I didn't read. Like again, you know, like I said, people think I know a lot about comics but Fantastic Four, definitely not a series I read a lot of growing up. I mean, I could probably, let's see here, I'll show you actually the handful of um, these two, actually, these two right here. Um, this issue of the Fantastic Four, which is all red, really cool cover. Um, can't really make it out, but it's the Human Torch on the front, kind of flying around. It's just really, really cool. That's the only reason I picked it up. And then um, this issue here. These are only two issues that I picked up like in current publication when they came out of the Fantastic Four. Everything else is stuff that I've gone back and trying to like rediscover the characters and um, kind of get like a little bit more insight. And I've actually started reading uh, Fantastic Four, their stories from like eras like uh, 60s and 70s, which has been um, a pretty fun read as well. Uh, but I just love these uh, older comics. You know, you got the classic at last, it's clobbering time on the cover during the whole run of the, uh, the black suit, the black suit Spider-Man. And uh, we got the little sticker price on there. I think I paid 250 for this comic book. When it first came out, it was only 60 cents, but it's in really good condition. So this guy definitely deserves a new, um, a new house. And this is done by, oh no way. So I mentioned, The last issue, I'm gonna check this out real quick. Here. John Byrne. John Byrne. I think John Byrne got a lot of, um, yeah, I think John Burn 
I best know him for his Superman run in the 90s. So yeah, okay, really, really cool, really cool stuff. Really great artwork inside of here. Very classic, elegant comic book artwork. Collaborative. All right, um, we're gonna jump into the G's here. We've got a the original Ghost Rider Rides Again, part one of seven. This is actually like a reprint of uh, some of the older stories, but gosh, I don't think this thing has had a new bag and board since I bought this thing back in like the early 90s. Um, it's a really cool story. Um, where we have, um, the retelling of uh, Johnny Blaze and his origin into um, the the Ghost Rider himself. Um, like I said, I believe this is a reprint um, of an original original story, probably from like I don't know, maybe like the late seventies or early eighties. And then we also have um, this guy, which they got the boards like poking out of the side here and just all wrinkly on the back just not a very good board and bag uh, but it's a Doctor Strange Ghost Rider crossover and I always felt like crossovers not only lend themselves to really fun um, covers because you know the more characters you get on a cover I feel like the uh, you know like the cooler the cover I mean you know it's one thing you know it's like oh cool like you know this Deadpool cover, which, you know, I get what they're trying to say. It's all about Deadpool, you know, whatever. Um, but then you throw something like this together. It's just like, got a lot going on, the buildings, and uh, the magic flying up through the air, Ghost Rider riding up the magic on his flaming motorcycle, Doctor Strange ascending up to follow him. Just really, really, really cool cover. But yeah, this guy definitely, definitely it's a new bag and board. All right, guys, so uh, we've hit the um, H's. Well, I guess this isn't actually an I because he's quite incredible. We all know him. He's a friend from work. <laughs> he's the Incredible Hulk. Now, this is actually the very, very first Incredible Hulk, like the issue, the very first Incredible Hulk comic I ever, ever picked up. Um, it was one of those where... Uh, I was just getting into uh, new characters, um, and you know, I came in um, as you can see. They're, they're celebrating their thirtieth anniversary. I started collecting comics, a lot of um, issues and stuff like this, in like the the late, um, excuse me, um, early nineties. So like we're talking like ninety two, ninety three, um, and a lot of these characters were created in the sixties, sixty two, sixty three, sixty five, sixty one. And so, like, I was kind of coming into the celebration of this, like, 30 years of Marvel characters and Marvel comics. And so they were doing a lot of cool uh, covers where, if I'm sure, uh, you give me one second. Actually, this guy needs a new uh, back and board. I'm kind of glad I went and looked for him. But again, here we got the foil vision. This is one of my favorite, favorite covers right here, alternate visions. Um, but again, um, the beginning of the 30th celebration of the Avengers. And then, like I said, we have um, the special 30th anniversary issue of the Hulk, also done with this gold foil. Um, got some raised, um, some raised lettering going on here. And this is actually like a recreation of the original cover for the Incredible Hulk, the original story. Um, very much uh, like an updated version of that, of that cover. But this is one of those like walking by the newsstand again, that little spinning rack inside the uh, grocery store. I'm looking at it, I'm like, Dad, please. I mean, like most comics back in the day, were like a dollar twenty-five, a dollar seventy-five. This one was two fifty. I'm like, Dad, please, please, can I get this one? Can I please get this one? And so, uh, this was the first, like I said, Incredible Hulk issue that I ever picked up, and you know, kind of led me um, to fall in love with the character. This is a fun issue because it not only has a um, direct 
uh, you know, connection to the, you know, issue 392, 394 run. This is issue 393. So this has definitely got like that connecting piece and the overall Incredible Hulk storyline, but it also has a few extra adventures uh, thrown in there. One of my favorites is one crook being captured by the various incarnations of the Incredible Hulk over the years. And for your, those of you who don't know exactly what I'm talking about, uh, you know, the, the, the cinematic universe did a great job of capturing this as well, but the Incredible Hulk has kind of gone through uh, variations where, you know, he's been green, stupid, he's been kind of smart, he's been gray, um, he's been green and smart. And so, um, this one criminal keeps getting caught by different variations of the Incredible Hulk throughout time. And every time the Hulk meets him, he has no idea who this guy is because the other personality or the other kind of incarnation of the Hulk, even though it's the same Hulk, um, has caught this guy over over the years. So it's just one of my favorite favorite stories. And like I said, uh, led me to my, to my love with that character. And in fact, this was, um, few issues here in this run probably need a new yeah this is 394 this one probably needs a new bag and board this one I didn't buy after this issue like I bought 393 and I've got like a few others that came after this one actually went back and bought um, recently I believe I got it at stories uh, comics back in Richmond Virginia but yeah this guy needs a new this guy needs a new home as well